or it doesn't correct, it gives all the variant, the variant writings in the Greek so that you know that there are differences and variances between the Greek text. And it gives you the majority text, that is what most scholars agree to as the text. And then down in the subscripts here, it shows all the variant readings of the text. And this includes, remember I, told, I mentioned last week that the two parts that, that are still included in the majority text, and you'll find them in most Bibles, but the woman caught in adultery and also the last chapter of Mark are not found in the oldest documents of the New Testament documents of Mark and of, well, we don't know where the woman caught in adultery is. It's variously found in Matthew and Mark and in John, I believe. could be in Luke, too. You have to look in your Bible, because in your Bible, it'll say, in the script, in the subnotes, it'll say that this is found in all these places, you know, so you need to check to make sure. In any case, you want to take a look at this? It's in Greek, so. <laughs> I don't read Greek. Find Vassilov. I told you I'd bring it. I'll take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask. I know it's not Greek, but what about the Greek Orthodox Church? Yeah, I knew people asked about that. Okay, what they found is they found a, a text, a piece of uh, script or a piece of paper, what about postage size, right, or, or postcard size, that talks about Jesus' wife. Okay, okay. First of all, did they ever say where they found it? No. They need to tell us where they found it. Because there's something that you find in the ancient world. Guess what? I don't know what's beeping. I guess we're not... Exploding. It's okay. It can beep. I don't mind. I just, you know, I, I just worry if we're going to like, uh, you know, explode or something. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, no, 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 bangs, right? Don't, but you don't have to leave. You put up, unless you're calling for you. Oh. Okay, so it's very important to note that we have never, ever, ever found Gnostic documents in the same place that we find the documents that we uphold. You know, I tried to talk, and Tammy said I was incochate last week, so I tried to be more coherent. She said I was all over the place, and I didn't mean to be all over the place. I was trying to give the, the people that have been here before something new, and the people that have been here, not been here before, something old, so they had some footnotes, but I'll try to be more cohesive. In any case, the thing is that, that we've never found what we consider the legitimate historical documents of Christianity, and that's what we talked about last week, is historical documentation of veracity, and the Gnostic documents together. So the Nagamati, most of the Nagamati documents you will not find, you'll find lots of Gnostic documents, but none of the authentic Christian documents. And the thing about the Gnostics, remember the Gnostics, and uh, if you were here the first class I, I wrote out, you know, you start with animism, and then you go to pantheonic paganism, and then you go to mysterion, and then you go to Gnosticism. And one of the big things about the Gnostics is in the Gnostic credo is Jesus is a... Anybody know about the Gnostics? Jesus is a man. You guys ever heard the Arian heresy? You know what the Arian heresy is? There's the Arian heresy... But we're not Aryan in our viewpoint. We are Nicene. Okay, guys. Okay. Look, you know, everybody <laughs> look, everybody talks about the Nicene, the Council of Nicaea, and they all think that in the Council of Nicaea, they all the documents of the New Testament were said, these are the the uh, God breathed documents, right? And I told you it's not true. What was the whole point of the Council of Nicaea? There's only one point in the Council of Nicaea. To respond to the some of the heresies that were going on. Yeah, to respond specifically to the Arian heresy. The Arians believe that, that Christ was created by God as a man. See? So he was a man. Not fully God, but only man. But he was created by God. And by the way, that's what the Gnostics believe. Arian and Gnosticism go together. Okay? Nicaeans believe what? Christ was not created, but begotten. begotten at the same time. And there's three parts. In Arian heresy, there's only two parts to God. The two parts are God the Father and God the Spirit, and Christ was created. So Christ is a created being in the Arian heresy. Where in, in the Nicene view, 
God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one and three. They're three and one. Okay, all this stuff, right? That's what we do in the Anastasian Creed, right? In any case, the, then that is what the whole Council of Nicaea was about. That's why we have our ideas about Christ the way we do today. Yes, ma'am. Well, I heard that it was from 400 A.D., this, this little piece of paper, right. which yeah. would be after the council, which would be very late. Well, see, the thing is, right. what I'm telling you is this. If I know where the document comes from, mm -hmm. if it's not Hamadi, it's Gnostic. See? They haven't told us where it came from. we got to know the source. Because it, if it's a Gnostic document, the Gnostics talk about Jesus' wife all the time. Okay? okay? Mary Magdalene is called, you know, if you if you read the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Mary, these are all documents I haven't covered in these classes. You know, I, I can, I've taught classes on this before. I have not taught a class at Holy Cross about the uh, Archco documents, or the Archco documents are probably authentic, or the non-authentic documents that are found that are, that are considered New Testament apocryphal, right? There's 44 Gospels we know. Of the 44 Gospels, 14 are extant. We have copies. And of the 14, there's only four that we hold as authentic historical Gospels. Have you read the 14? Nobody's read the other, what, 30? Because they're lost. I hope we find them someday. It'd be really cool. But you got to realize that a lot of these documents are Gnostic documents created by the Gnostics. You know, for example, uh, one of the most famous Gnostic documents, which is probably the, one of the earliest documents that we have about Christ, is, um, what's that thing called? Um, Gospel of Thomas is one of the oldest Gnostic documents we have, and the oldest sayings gospel it comes from a way early first century period. So, but you know it's the early church. Rejected. See? The thing is that you know, we've got to know the <clears throat> it's just like, you know, remember when we went through the thing, and I know I didn't do it as clearly as I should, but you have the bibliographical tests. So we how many copies of this document do we have? Thomas. One. No, no, of the uh, Gospel of Thomas, we have three. But we have one of the um, of this little document that talks about Jesus' wife, right? We have one. And how old is it between the writing and the period? It's fourth century, so that means 400 years, or, well, okay, 350 at least. So that's not too bad. I mean, that's not too bad. Um, the we got to know that the authentic, you know, to authenticate it, we have to have a little more information. And by the way, I need you to know this: that the classical scholars reject a lot of the gospel documents. Um, we find a lot of really, really early gospel stuff. And for example, in the um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's some real evidences. Like for example, there's some evidences that push Matthew and Mark, Matthew specifically, back to around. Um, about, I'm trying to think of the exact date, I think 60, 60 AD or so, okay? I mean, actual fragments, okay? Fragments in that period. But guess what? What do the scholars say? It's not whole. It's not complete. So immediately, most times, scholars will reject it because they're singular copies and fragments, Right? But guess what they didn't do with this one? Harvard failed it. Well, this lady's uh, bound to make a lot of money. She's going to make money on this fragment, right? And she wants to make money. That's the way it works, she wants right? It to be true. She wants it to be true. It's most likely very false. It's probably a Gnostic, you know, it's typical Gnostic stuff. You find them all the time. Or, or it can be just made. Somebody just made it. In fact, a lot of Coptic scholars, and by the way, Coptic. Okay, Coptic. What do you know about Coptic? Egyptian. Well, is it the original? Yeah, it's Egyptian. And by the way, is that the original language of the Gospels? No. So you're looking at a lot of the documents we have, you know, old, the ancient copies are Coptic, which is cool. So? Well, and, and the, the commentator 
on the radio that was commenting about this thing. Um, you know, and I don't know what word they used for wife, but you know, it, it, Jesus is taught the church is the bride of Christ. So over and over and over in the scriptures, and they said, you know, it may, may mean that, it may not. But I don't know what word they used. They said wife also. Well, see, I don't do Coptic. I do Greek. You know, um, and so I don't know what words Coptic has for, you know, wife and women and whatever. I know what words Greek has, and I can tell you a lot about the Greek. We're going to find out when we start digging into Romans a lot about the Greek words or Greek possibilities of words for woman and wife and male and female and that kind of thing. But, yeah, I don't know. So I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't pay much attention to it. Well, and, and that's the point. Until they prove, look, the Gospels and the, the works of the New Testament documents are so authentic and so proven that someone pulling a slip of Coptic that's the size of a postcard and a fragment and throwing it out and saying, here's my trump card on Jesus. Yeah. Look, they're an idiot, right? No, no true scholar from Harvard, did, well, okay, Harvard Divinity School is really toasted to Turbine School anyway. Did any good out come out of Harvard Divinity School that you know of? Any great... Any great evangelists? Any great preachers? From Harvard? From Harvard Divinity School? Well, uh, since, <laughs> since uh, we'll, we'll qualify that. In, in the so, 20th century and above. Say, John Adams would be one. But in the 20th not, century and above. What he's been. Well, what about, uh, you know, one of the most, who's that guy? Who's the really famous guy? He started at Harvard, didn't he? The um, Edmund, not Edmund Burke, that's uh, the... Edwards, Edwards, Jonathan Edwards. Did, what, what university did Jonathan Edwards start? I think it was Harvard. Jonathan Edwards is probably one of the famous, most famous evangelists and scholars, you know, from the early uh, colonial period. But anyway, we digress. But that's okay. I'm just saying that anybody throwing out, you know, a scrap of Coptic and saying, that's is Jesus, you know, is, is a nuthead. But, you know, you could tell that, right? Did you see the picture of the person? Anyway. <laughs> The what? Gospel of the Da Vinci Code. Well, the Da Vinci Code is just nuts anyway. I mean, we've, I've well, talked about how... it's a gospel, it's, isn't it? The Da Vinci Code, a modern gospel. Years, maybe it will be. I don't know. Could be. And Lionel, I heard that the penmanship was so poor on you. you know, and well, look, if you're, if you're a poor guy working in Egypt, you know, one of the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, and you're writing Coptic documents to, to sell to Harvard, really? right, your penmanship's not very good either. They don't have any... Uh, Electric lights there either. So, anyway, let's talk about Romans. <laughs> All right. Change the subject, you mean? Well, you know, this is kind of like Romans, isn't it? Anyway, I'll start down here. L O G O S. Logos. Logos, and it's it's this is its word that is almost always paired. Telos. Telos. Logos and telos. Now, what is Logos? You guys have probably heard. You know, remember, it's the famous thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That's from, from John, right? And everybody has told you quite correctly that that Word is Logos. What they didn't tell you is that Logos doesn't really mean Word in Greek. Logos does not really mean Word in Greek. Logos means... Literally, and I, I didn't give it to you today, I'll eventually give it to you because this is one of those important reflective words that we, we have to know in Greek. This is a critical word in Greek. But logos means literally an, a logical argument. Logical argument. Now, I haven't gone through the words for, there, there are in Greek, there's approximately eight words that are commonly used for say and said in Greek. For say and said. They can also be used quite loosely and incorrectly to, for word, but they are say and said. When the Greeks told you that they were going to tell you something, they told you how they were going to tell you. So if I tell you my opinion, it's femi. I'm going to give you my opinion, I'm giving you a femi. If I'm going to tell you a logical argument... I'm going to tell you a logos. If I'm going to tell you just small talk, it's lelo. If I'm going to tell you a story, it's remi. So the Greeks and in the New Testament, it always tells you how they're going to tell you. Whether it's your opinion, whether it's a logos, 
whether, you know, it's whatever. The most common word used in the New Testament happens to be the word logos, because when they're talking to you, they are telling you a logical argument. The reason this is true is because, remember I told you, we, and we can never get this out of our minds, in English, when we write, we write, I know you get tired of this, right? But you got to never forget intro, body, and conclusion. When we write in Greek, how do we write? We write a logos to tell us. And we'll get to that in a second. When we write, just for a contrast, when we write Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, we write synopsis body, right. Synopsis body. Now, I, I gave you a new one. How did the Romans write? Like we did. Romans. Intro body conclusion. So do you think the Greeks drove them crazy? Yes. Yes. It drives us crazy, right? But what you got to realize is that Paul is writing to a mixed audience. We're going to find out about that mixed audience. But he is a Greek writer. And remember, when you write Greek, you're not just writing the Greek. What do you have? You have a grammateus who's come to help you make sure your Greek is right. And the grammateus is going to insist on what? <laughs> Logos to tell us. Even if you're writing a letter to your mother, especially if she's a Greek mother. She's going to expect it to be Logos to tell us, because if you don't, she's going to pound you and say, look, child, I sent you to school for 50 years, and you didn't learn to write Logos to tell us. What are you, an idiot, right? I mean, doesn't your mother tell you that now? I mean, look, I sent you to school for 12 years, and you didn't learn how to use me and my and, right, and I? So, me, my, and I? In any case, the Logos is what is critical. You've got to understand this Logos, and what is really important is the reason that, and I'll, get, I'll tell you this because this is really important. Remember that John, it says, in the beginning was the word. And literally, it is the, in the beginning was the logical argument. What does that come from? Any, anyone have an idea? I've told you before. I'll tell you again many times. In LXX, which is Greek, it says... In the beginning was God. That's the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning was God, Theos. And the Ruach, it's not Ruach, it's Panuma. In Greek it's Panuma. The Panuma of God rested on the waters. The Spirit of God rested on the waters. And God Logosed. And God Logosed. This is why John writes, in the beginning was God, and with God was the Word, right? And the Word was with God, right? Mm -hmm. Because he is repeating from the Septuagint, so that no one could miss that John is telling us that who is also God? Jesus. Jesus. Not only that, that Jesus is the logical argument that results in what? Well, the creation, because in, in Hebrew, the words are, the words in Hebrew are Elohim, gods, with a singular verb, Ruch, which is the Ruch HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit, and the Amar. The Amar is the command word that God spoke to create. So in Genesis, you have the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. Okay? And the Septuagint represents this really nicely because it says Theos, Panuma, and Logos. So John writes, in the beginning was God, and the Word was with God. The Logos was with God. See? you got to get this because this is so important. The Logos is not Word. The Logos is the logical argument. The Telos is the unstated conclusion. And a Telos literally in Greek, I probably should use a different color, if one will work here. The telos, oh, this one probably works. The telos, here is the telos in Greek. The telos is the vanishing point on the horizon. 
Now, we'll get more into this, but just so you know, the telos, like I said, is non-stated. That's why we put an arrow underneath it. Because the Greeks never stated the telos. Remember Aesop's Fables? That's the example I gave you. The Greeks never wrote down the moral of Aesop's Fables. That was assumed that you would figure it out from the logos. Okay? But Aesop's Fables are a beautiful example of that. Yes, sir? When, because it vanishes, does that mean that there is more to be determined? I mean, the, the, that, I mean yeah, the, whole, the whole state of, of this discussion started with, these are the documents we have thus found. There may be other documents when they are determined to be or not to be with all the tests involved to be accurate, truthful, etc., the telos may continue to change? I would, well, the Greeks would say, how many teloses are there on the horizon? Infinite. Mm -hmm. yeah. Infinite. See? But based where you are, based what knowledge you have. Well, but the Greeks would also say, and remember, this is what I didn't want to get to yet, but I'll just mention it. A parabola, a parable has how many teloses? One. A hyperbole, a hyperbole in Greek, has how many? Infinite. Okay? And a diabola, diablo, has none. See? So the Greeks were really cognizant of this. And remember what I told you in the Gospels class. How many implied teloses are there from the Gospel logos? A single one. See? So there is a single, but you're taking a very Catholic view, which I think is good of you. That you know, if we find other historical documents, I'll say you're a uh, big. <laughs> I don't know what that means, right? If if it's the Catholic, if you mean the Catholic Church, is this is are we talking uh, German or English, or are we talking C as in you mean Catholic faith as in whole? Universal. So I guess universal, universal Catholic. No, actually, it's a big C because you know the Catholic Church has always viewed until the Reformation period, the documents in the New Testament is historical. It was only the Reformation guys that started calling them uh, inspired, which is what causes some of our problems today. But I mentioned that the other uh, last Hypothetical. week. Hypothetical. You could have multiple logos and a single vanishing point for each one of them at the same point. Uh, um, yes, this is true because in actuality, as we looked at the Gospels, each, one are all, separate each Gospel is a different logos but with the same telos. So you could or put multiple telos. squares up there with the same vanishing point. You could. The Greeks are really neat this way. You know, in English, and, and by the way, uh, we don't write quite as intellectually, I don't think, as the Greeks do, although we try pretty hard. The Romans recognized that if you organize your writing this way, this is great for science. This is great for science. But this is better for philosophy. philosophy. Yeah, philosophy. Anyway, let's go on. I have one, one final question. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> Do the Greeks have a word for illogical argument? Yes. Mm. Well, no, no. They, they actually do. Anistologius, an, um, a, a, an argument that has basically has no meaning. So who decides whether it's a logical argument or not? And then I'll the, the Greeks would say, now this is really important. How hard was it to write how hard was it to write stuff down? Really hard, right? The Greeks would argue quite incorrectly that if it's written down, it's probably a logos. You know, that's that's the way they thought. In other words, if someone put enough thought into it, they wrote it down, then it's gotta be logical. Now, we with lots of paper and lots of illogical thoughts know that's completely untrue. But the Greeks would also then say, who determines whether it is a logos or not? Uh, when I'm presenting a logos to you, it's the best thought out logos that I can present, right? So who determines whether my logos is a good logos or not? The reader. The reader. You do. Yeah, you do. See, the Greeks would say this is self-correcting. Because if you read it and you can figure it out, right, then you know it's bad or good. But let's go on. There's, there's, this is really important. You think, you say, well, does this have anything to do with Romans or with the Gospels or with any of these Greek writings that we study? And I say, yes, it does because of this. This word right here. 
P-I-S-T-E-O-S. Pisteos. Pisteos and pisteo. 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 The reason is because when I gave the word pistis, and look, okay, I give you the declined word from the Greek. This is the Greek word that actually comes out of our New Testament. So I'm not going to go into Greek declensions, but this is pistis. In its, but this is a declined form of pistis. And pistis happens to be a verb. Pistis means to convince. To convince by a logos. To convince by a logos. If you're convinced by a logos, you have agreed to the logos. Do you see this? So, pistis, and this word pisteo means that you have been convinced. So this is, this is a, a noun which means been convinced. Okay? The problem with this is what word is this always translated to be in English? Faith. Faith. And what word is this translated to be? Belief. In the Greek, what does it mean? Well, it's not right to say what does it mean to have faith. What does it mean in the Greek that we keep reading faith and faith and faith? It means to, to be convinced of a logos. That's what it means. This is probably the primary word that really irritates me in our translations because this is a wrongly translated word. You should take your Bibles out. And every time it says faith, you should write pistis or you should write to convince in there. And where it says belief, you should write been convinced or convinced there. Because this is a gross, in my opinion, mistranslation. Because what do we think of when we think of faith? Trust. Trust in what? Nothingness. Trust in, in, in something unseen or unknown, right? Where when I say convinced to, of an argument, it, it implies what? An informed opinion. Yeah, it's an informed opinion. Someone has given you knowledge, and you have made an informed choice, an informed decision about what you're going to do with it. You actually act upon it. And when I say the word belief, in our vocabulary, belief means, I believe. I believe. Well, so do the Hindus. They believe. And so do the Islamists. They believe. And so do all these other people. They believe. Some people believe in crystals. And some people believe in all kinds of stuff. You know? But does, it, does that mean anything? It's meaningless. Because you can believe in all day in a heifer God. But it don't mean a heifer God is going to do anything for you. Or even existent, right? So the Greeks, look. I tell you that, you know, we, our viewpoint of the Greeks is what? Metaphysical. Spiritual. Is it? When you think of Greek, what do you think of? Well, most people probably think of debauchery and whatever. But you notice all these documents are Greek. And the Greeks are well known for philosophy. Now, when we think of philosophy, and that's what I was going to get to next, we think, uh, I'll, I'll give you cosmos as a word, I think it's next week. But when we think of philosophy, we think of Freud. metaphysics and Freud, and right, right, Kafka. But in actuality, it, and I put this to remind myself because I'll draw you a picture. In the Greek worldview, in the Greek view, there is Theos, Theos, which is God, yeah. and God exists, right? And He exists in the plenum, the plenum. It's in Greek, it's plenario, plenum of everything. And God created, and God created the, the cosmos, the cosmos. Within the cosmos is philosophia, philosophia. And philosophia is literally what man can know. It literally translates in the Greek to the love of wisdom. But if you look deep at the words, what it means is what man can know. This is because within the cosmos is stuff that you can know. Can you know everything that's in the created universe? 
It's impossible. See? And then within philosophia is what the Greeks would call reality. And I'm, I, I probably, well, I probably could talk just a little bit so you can be grounded in this. But within philosophia, for example, you said reality. Is there stuff that's outside of empiricism that I can't, you know, empirical? Right, empiricism, that's the watchword in the modern era. Dawkins said, if you can't prove God to me empirically, I don't believe. Well, guess what things I can't prove to Dawkins empirically? Think about it. What can I not prove empirically? Huh? Like love, like emotions. I can never know. You can tell me all day that you love me or you like me or you think I'm, I'm like better than sliced bread or you hate me. But how do I know it's true? There's no way that I can know it's true. Even if you throw a, a punch at me. You might, you know, I mean, it's not unusual for people to love each other and throw punches at each other. <laughs> right? Right? You don't have to hate somebody to throw a punch at them. See? I'm not advocating. I'm just saying it happened, right? So and we know it happens. So I'm just saying, you know, how do you know that someone loves you? You know, it's empirically impossible to know. You might attach your brain to brainwave monitor. I probably would never know. There's other things. What other things can never be proved empirically? Well, there's lots of things. <laughs> there's lots of stuff. That's correct. Mathematics cannot be proved empirically. I can't use a scientific method to prove mathematics. There's lots of stuff, language stuff. There's all kinds of things I can't prove empirically. But do they exist? Yeah. That's philosophia. Those are things within, and philosophy incorporates reality. That's why when you're a PhD, you're a doctor of philosophy. philosophy. See? Aha. All fits together, right? In any case. That's why this is so important, this idea. Because faith and belief, which is pisteo and pistis, verb and noun, means to be convinced of a logical argument. And it all comes out of this idea. Like I said, philosophy to the Greeks was reality, was what they could know, not esoteric, highfalutin, highbrow stuff. This word, M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, -M mysterion, mysterion. I gave you the specifics. Look, this is from Strong's, okay? So I'm trying to help you a lot. Literally, it's from a der derivative of muo, muo, to shut the mouth. A secret or mystery through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites. And this is translated in the King James as mystery. Look, look. Is there any way that you can translate the word mysterion as mystery? No, not even at the time of the King James. There is no way that anyone could translate this word mystery. So why did it end up being translated mystery? It's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't. Probably right, no. because they did not want to call Christianity a mystery. Well. Because it was a, it was a, a religious, a religious type of worship. In actuality, I believe that for a long time the church, you know, at first the church resisted the idea of being called a mysterion, but very quickly the church kind of started saying, hey, this is working for us. Let's keep it going, right? So the church probably didn't mind being called Christian, which meant it was a mysterion, right? And eventually it got to the point where, oh, by the way, remember the word church the Orthodox call themselves Ecclesia, which is rather than the New Testament, but you know the, the other Christians call themselves going to churches, which is right out of the Mithrin Mysterium. So I, I, I would describe saying they didn't. What happened to the word mystery? And I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but what happened to the word mystery is the word mystery changed in English. Because remember in the Middle Ages, what was the big deal about the Middle Ages? The what kind of plays? Mystery plays. Mysterion plays. And what is a mystery play? Is a mystery play about a mystery? No. Not at all. Where did the whole idea of a mysterion or a mystery play come from, guys? Greek. Why? What's about the Greek plays? What is it about the Greek plays? They're all religious. They're all religious. 
This is something that you need to tell the teachers in the American public school system and every other school system for that matter because it seems like the U.S. ain't got the idea. When the Greeks did a play, the whole purpose in the play was for religious reasons. Every Greek play was written for the religious festivals. Every Greek play is religious. It may seem sacrilegious to you, but it's religious to them. And so when they wrote it, it was intended to be a religious document, just like the New Testament and the Old Testament and everything else like that, except it was, it was fiction. Okay? So the Greeks wrote their plays. Now, what happened where, okay, we got Greek Christians. By the way, Christian looks like a mysterion. The Greek Christians, when they started moving into Rome and started moving into the lower areas in Europe and started moving out, what did they bring with them? <clears throat> the plays. Because before I was doing mystery plays, religious plays about the gods, and now I'm doing mystery religious plays about Jesus. the God. Yeah, Jesus. And about because it's an evangelical message, right? Mm -hmm. And if you ever read the mystery plays, you go see the mystery plays. They're really cool. There's a famous one at oh, what Omar Aragal? Anybody ever been to the mystery play at Omar Aragal? It's all about the life of Christ, right? The mystery plays were not just about the life of Christ. They're they're famous mystery plays. We don't do them anymore. You know, in a lot of places, they've become just tradition. But what happened to the word mystery is the word mystery changed from about mysterion in English and became to be about mysteries. And part of that was because of the religious thing. Because remember I told you about mysterions? We know there's still mysterions around. And people told me about mysterions. What are mysterions? A mysterion literally is where you have a secret initiation in a religious organization mm -hmm. or even a non-religious organization that may have religious overtones. So for example, what is an example of a mysterion today? Mm -hmm. Sororities, fraternities, the Masons, um, uh, Mormons are a mysterion. They're an Aryan group too. There are other groups that have mysterions or that are mysterions, true mysterions, because if they have a secret initiation right the difference with Christianity is what is it about Christianity that makes it not a mysterium, but it looks like a mysterium? The mystery has been solved. Well, not only is the mystery, the mystery is, is told, it's shared, it's open. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's the mystery of Christ. But not only that, the other big point about the mysteries is in Christianity is do we have them in secret? They're no, they're all public. Remember public baptism? The only reason the church didn't do it publicly in the time of the Roman, uh, well, before they were a regio legitis, is why? They kill them. Yeah. But they would invite anyone that would come, you know, to the events. The same thing's true today. So that's the difference. Um, this word, let's see, P H A N E R O T H E N T O S. Pathanos. And the reason I gave you this word is it's very important because Paul uses this word all the time to mean the manifestation of the Logos. The manifestation of the Logos. And the reason this is an important word is because Venero means literally to shine, to be manifest by rays. A revelation in English would probably be close to this. But remember, the Greeks are literal. In, in our idea, a revelation is what? in thought, right? But to the Greeks, the idea of a revelation, the word they use is literally to shine, to shine out. So when Paul talks about this being revealed, he's talking in two ways, because remember he's talking to Romans, and he's talking to Hebrews, and he's talking to Greeks. So he means Greeks, phanero, phanero, which means to shine, but he's also talking to these other guys who would see this as figurative. In other words, to be revealed. And, what's, and he also used another word, apocalypto, which we'll talk about in the future. But in any case, the reason this is an important word to us, Phineros, is because in a mysterion, what did you do? You let your light shine. See? The revelation of the light was a huge thing in mysterion. So when we see these words being used by Paul, they are code words. Well, 
They weren't code words to these Greek speakers. They were what kind of words to these Greek speakers? Everyday, Everyday obvious knowledge. But to us, they become code words because we don't understand what they mean. And by the way, we mistranslate it because whether we, we translate this, we translate this as literally in the King James to appear, manifestly declare, manifest, and show. Uh, that's a long ways from to shine out in a revelation, isn't it? See? That's the problem with a lot of these Greek words, is they're very concrete words that we have done what to? Well, we've made them figures of speech. We've made them like we're used to words being, which are, you know, our words are dual-use words all the time. They have concrete meanings, and they also have figurative meanings. Where the Greek words are what? Almost 100% concrete. Our words are mushy. Well, our words are really mushy, right? In the Greek, if I tell you I agape you, it means a whole lot different than if I say I love you in English. I don't know how I'm loving you in English, right? But in Greek, I know exactly what I'm thinking. In any case, let's look at, and I gave you some of the text. This is kind of the way I do it. Um, let me see if I can get to this text so that we can... I want to look at the specifics in looking at the... Uh, uh, the beginning of Romans here. So if you got Romans, you can look at it. You can also look at some of the texts I gave you. Chapter 1-1. One, one. Paul a doulos. Doulos means a slave. Now, why they translate it servant? I don't know, but slave, it's a slave of Christos. Literally, anointed one. Comes from the word for sacred oracle. Jesus is Yesu, which is from the Hebrew Yeshua. Uh, by the way, uh, we we make Yeshua what in English? Jesus. Not really. We make Yeshua uh, Joshua. Oh. But to keep it clear between Joshua and Jesus, we make Jesus Jesus. It's really Yeshua, but whatever. Called to be an apostle, and that means apostolos. Apostle is an apostolos in Greek. An apostolos is, um, well... I, I didn't give you the word, but you know, literally, it, it's a set apart, but it's really close to one of these sacred words that means a uh, basically a thing from the gods. Let me see, I got it right here. I got the notes in my notes. I have it. Literally, a apostolos, a delegate and ambassador. Literally, from apostolo, which means to be set apart. But who do you set apart? Basically, in the Greek worldview. You set apart priests and priestesses. You set apart people to do this. And by the way, the reason that's important is because it says set apart, it's aphorize, literally to set by a boundary. And, and okay, this is really interesting because this is where Greek and Hebrew and English collide. Because if you remember those words, what, what is freedom to the Hebrew? You remember that back when we were talking about the Psalms? What does freedom mean to a Hebrew? Bound but large. Bound but large. In other words, to a Hebrew viewpoint, freedom means that it's bound, but it's a large expanse. But it's still bound. The law. They would say the law, the Torah, bound it. That's very figurative, right? But that's the way they view the world. So it's, it uses the word to set apart as aphorize. And you can take what you want from this. But this is a very Hebraic type word and also a very Greek word. But the word does not mean set apart. It means to be limited. Now, a Greek or a Hebrew reader of this is going to immediately know that he's talking about what? The Torah and the limitations of the Hebrew worldview. A Greek speaker is going to immediately think what? What do you think the Greeks would think about this word? Well, we'll get there in a second, but why would, what's limited or set apart? I mean, you just use the word, an apollos, uh, an apostolos is already one set apart for a sacred duty. Okay? That's already set apart for a sacred duty. But now, he uses a word that he's bound. Limited. Well, I'll let you cogitate on that, because this is just very interesting. You know, because remember, well, we're going to see who he's writing to in a second. But he goes on for the euangelion. And euangelion is a really, really important word. Euangelion for the gospel. Now, gospel. What 
is the word gospel. Gospel comes from what language? It's Anglo-Saxon. Gospel is the Anglo-Saxon for good news. Okay? It's Anglo-Saxon word. So, you angelion is the word that's used. You, EU means good in Greek, EU. Angelion means the message from the gods. It's a sacred word. And I've told you this before, if you guys have been in my class, why was this so important to the Greeks? Because the gods never had anything good to say, ever. Okay, anybody read the Odyssey and the Iliad? Did the gods ever tell you anything good in those things? No. When they came to us, like you're going to die, right? You know, How you're going to die. You're, you're going to marry your mother, <laughs> right? It's like this is ugly stuff, you know. But that's what they would tell you. And sometimes it'd be in retrospect, you know. I knew you were going to marry your mother, but I didn't tell you, right? <laughs> Oedipus Rex, right? And, well, and, and, and she's, and she's going to commit suicide, and you're going to punch your eyes out. I mean, this is really cool stuff. You know, the, the gods had no good to tell you. Matter of fact, if a guy came down to talk to you, it's like, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, talk to the hand. Here they listen, you know. That's why they say the good angelion, the good message from the gods. Okay? And literally in the Greek mind, this means the good message from the gods. You know, the Greek in the Greek worldview, Mark Paul even took this up. Even these people that are believing in Christ, you've got to get this because this is so important. In our cultural worldview, how many gods are there? There's one God, right? In our cultural worldview. In the Greek cultural worldview, how many gods are there? As many as you want. It's like Hinduism, see? It, monotheism is not the idea. So basically, what am I doing? I'm making a choice between gods. That's why this logos to tell us. That's why the whole idea is, Paul says, if you know this, you will do what? You'll, you'll accept it. Yes, you'll be convinced. See? We've made the word believe, but it's you'll be convinced, and you'll therefore accept it. Right? Because it's obvious. That's what's so important about this message, about this euangelion. And by the way, notice what Paul says. He doesn't say... You know, the word is the good news from the gods, the good message from the gods, the good, right? But he specifies it because he says, of Theos, of Theos. And the Theos to us is the capital G, God. Not Theosune, not gods, but God. So that's what's really critical that we see in this first, in the first verse. Now, the second verse tells us, Let's see what it goes it goes into here. It says, two, the euangelion, he, and the word is pro ipa angeliomai. Pro ipo angeliomai. And notice that the word has angelio, message of the gods, in it. In other words, the previously announced good message from the gods. Beforehand, through his Prophetes, his foretellers in the Hagios <coughs> scriptures. Okay, what are the Hagios scriptures to these guys? What are the holy scriptures? Hagios, we talked about Hagios before, but what is the Hagios? It's literally Hagios Grapha. Okay, it's not Hagios Panuma. What's Hagios Panuma? The breathe. It's not the Holy Spirit, and it's not. Theos Penuma, God breathed, it is literally the Hagios sacred thing writings, graphic <coughs> writings. So what are the, to these people, what are the Hagios sacred thing writings? It's Septuagint, LXX. Matter of fact, we're going to find it out. Because remember I told you I didn't put it on the paper today. There are 79 allusions to the apocryphal documents. And there are how many allusions? Like 70-something allusions or uh, uh, quotes and allusions to the Old Testament documents. 75. So guess what? He's already setting them up. 
right? He's telling them this logos to tell us is going to include what? First of all, he says this logos to tell us is from the God, from God, Theos. And then he tells you that he's going to be using what to prove it? And he's just told you what scriptures, because it's really important that he tells you. He didn't tell you that it was the membranus, and he didn't tell you it was scrolls, although it is scrolls. And he didn't tell you, he used the word specifically graphia. Okay? And it's the sacred graphia. And to these people, to the Greek Jews and the Greek Gentiles, what are the sacred graphia? Torah. No. LXX. LXX. The Septuagint. The Septuagint. Now, we don't, unfortunately, we don't accept part of it, even though Martin Luther did. That's my point last week, right? Martin Luther told you that you're supposed to be reading the Apocrypha. And by the way, what's really important is, was, okay, I... I know what the current viewpoint of belief is. But in reality, how many of you guys could look at the Old Testament without help and pick out all the prophetic things from it? I would say zero. How many of you guys could read the Apocrypha and find all kinds of pro-evangelion type messages in it? Everyone, because the holy Apocrypha is, most of the Apocrypha is what? Apocalyptic documents about the coming of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The coming of the Messiah. How many coming of the Messiah stuff's in the Old Testament? Oh. No, not a lot. Not a whole lot. No, there's some in. Remember, there's some in Psalms. And guess what? The Jewish people did it pretty quick after Christianity. Is that there's no messianic stuff in Psalms. There's some in Isaiah. And there's some in Jeremiah. Okay. But the problem is with those is uh, if you got to be cautious. Because you'll make the mistake of Tyre and Sidon. <laughs> Lucifer. What's the mistake of Lucifer? Why do we think Lucifer means devil or Satan? It's not in the Bible. Where did it come from? Milton. Not Milton Friedman. From Milton the poet. <laughs> Milton the poet wrote in Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, he called his hero Lucifer based mm -hmm. on the idea of a uh, 18th century preacher. See? But no one in the modern era, no one in any era really believed that. It was just a guy's idea, and Milton thought it was really cool to use that name. But Lucifer does not mean devil or whatever. But that's something people have assumed, because of lack of education, I think, you know, for years and years and years. The Lucifer, and it all comes from Milton. So lots of ideas come out of all kinds of sources, not necessarily biblical sources. We haven't studied that before. That's okay. Let's look at three of them. We have a little time to... And it goes on. So these are about regarding his son, who else, who as to his human sarks was a descendant of David. All right. He's writing this to Romans in Greek. So he just set down a bar. He just set down a line. Who is he also writing to? The Jews. The Jews. Because the only person that this would be important, this knowledge would be important to, is Jews. You notice what he starts with. He starts with, he says, at the beginning, he starts and he goes, he didn't even give him a greeting. He basically starts with that he's Paul, he's a slave of Christ, of Christ Jesus, be specific, called to be an apostolos, and I'm going to talk to you about the good news from the gods. And then he goes in and he says specifically where he's going to come get this good news from the gods from. This was previously announced good message from the gods beforehand through the prophets in the Hagios, the awful sacred thing scriptures, the Graphia writings, which these guys would be LXX because that's what they have in their pockets. Not quite, but that's what they have. And then he goes on and says this is a statement regarding his son as to his sarks was a descendant of David. He's already sitting down. He's already telling you who he's talking to. And look what he goes on to say. And who through the panuma, literally the excelled conscious breath, the, when, it, when we see the word panuma, and I don't have much time because we're getting to the end. When I say panuma, 
pneuma. There are, there are three parts to human beings. Pneuma in Greek worldview. Pneuma, uh, suke, <coughs> suke, and it's spelled right, suke and sarx. Sarx is flesh, the flesh on your bones, your bones. Suke is, uh, I spelled that wrong, but anyway, suke is the intellect, spirit and intellect, and pneume is the spirit as in soul, what we would call soul. Greece looks a little differently, but that's okay. We'll talk more about that. Look what it says. And through the pneuma, literally the, the, the spirit part, the, the soul, of hagosume, and I'll, I'll talk more about hagios words next week. I've already mentioned before. Was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection. And by the word, the Greek word is anastasis. Anastasis. From Necros. I'll just leave you with one thing because our time ran out. Remember, there is no word until later after Christ that means resurrection in any language. So the Greeks had no word for resurrection. The word that's translated here, resurrection, does not mean resurrection. It literally, anastasis means to stand up again. And it has to say, stand up again from the dead, from the necros. Because why? If I have no word for resurrection, how am I going to tell you that somebody was resurrected? So I have to find words, and Igirio is one of them, the other one is Anastasis. He's using this word because he's writing to the Romans. We're going to find out more about this next week as we go through Romans itself. And also there is an allusion to the Testament of Levi, and we'll talk about that next week. In any case, Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all you do for us. We pray you look after us through this week. In your name we pray, amen.